Um, I just want to welcome you all to the Liviana, fourth Liviana conference that the Community Economies Research Network has held. So this is the second week of our kind of dispersed conference over different time zones. Um, I'm Catherine Gibson. I think I know some of you, not all of you. And I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Darug people in the Sydney Basin here, the land of the Aurora Nation in Australia uh, in Sydney. Um, and I'm really thrilled to have uh, gathered together this panel of speakers um, to think about and hear about experiments with, with commoning and legal pluralities. So this came out of a, a discussion that a few of us were having over the northern summer, um, talking about experiments and, and uh, kind of skirmishes that are going on in different parts of the world, um, Ethan relating stories and, and Janelle relating stories. And I thought, well, it would be great to kind of get together and, and hear some of these and kind of try and think together about where are we at with the idea of kind of um, – legal frameworks and and commoning um com commoning and infrastructures and so on so commoning has been um, a theme that uh, community economies researchers have been really interested in for a long time but um there's also we're so happy to be joining together with others who have been working in this field for so long so we've got a mixture of um uh, practitioners and people and working in all sorts of different areas of commoning to speak so the plan is to have uh, four speakers for the 10 minutes. <clears throat> and the order is, first we'll start with, with Ethan Miller, who is a member of the Community Economies Institute, um, but also uh, a member of a major kind of commoning organisations, Land in Common and other, uh, uh, other things that he'll probably talk more about, um, and very much grounded in Maine. So, um, so Ethan's going to start, and then we're going to move to Janelle, Janelle Orsi, who's from the Sustainable Economies Law Centre. It's fantastic to have you, Janelle, joining us from the West Coast and talking from your experience. And I know you've had some very recent interesting um, interactions in communities and so on that you might possibly talk more about. Uh, and then we we're going to move to um, Roman, is that right? Yes. Roman Morgan, who's uh, a member of the Community Economies Research Network and Professor of Law at UNS at New South Wales University here in Sydney, uh, and also author of a chapter in the Handbook of Diverse Economies on legal pluralities, and also a, an activist in the community economy sector here in, in Australia. And then lastly, David Bollier, really wonderful to have you with us, David. Uh, Long-term commoner, uh, publisher of major books in the area of patterns of commoning and Fair, Free and Alive with Silke Helfrich, wonderful. Um, late author um, and collaborator and um, also a member of a, a new organisation of kind of people discussing commons and convergence issues and so on. So David's got an incredible kind of overview of things going on all over the place and we'll, we'll, we'll end up the, the panel. So the plan is to have some um, thoughts from each of you and then some discussion between you and then uh, open it up for everybody else who's here Nice to see a few more faces joining us since we, as the hour goes on and kids have headed off to school and all the other things that are going on at this end of, <laughs> of life. So um, is there anything else I need to do at this point? I don't think I need to remind anybody to, to you know, act with respect and all the other things we normally do at this kinds of um, following. So without any um, anything else to say, um, I'll hand it over to Ethan and I'll just put my little 10 minute timer on Ethan to let you know when 10 minutes is up. Is that good? Great. Thanks. Thanks, Kath. Hi, everybody. It's really great to be here. Um, I am talking to you from Wabanaki, Wabanaki homelands, specifically unceded land of the Amiskagan Abenaki people. Um, in what's colonially called the town of Green, Maine, USA. And um, I am, yeah, I'm just really excited to be sharing the space with you all and just to be in conversation with um, my fellow panelists, all of whom have inspired me in lots of different ways over many years. And some of you I haven't met, Janelle, I'm really excited to be in the space with you. You're 
work at Sustainable Economies Law Center has actually been huge to the work that I've been doing for the last bunch of years. So it's it's a it's a ripple of your work out in the world that I'm reflecting back. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, and it's it's also just really nice to be in this conversation space. I've been out in the nursery digging trees for the last five days and my body hurts. <laughs> so it's nice to, it's actually refreshing to sit in front of a Zoom screen for once. <laughs> and um, and yeah, so I um, I live at a place called Wild Mountain Cooperative, which we think of as a community of communities, a bunch of different grassroots um, land-based social change organizations that are commoning together here. And the land is held by Land in Common Community Land Trust, which is my other day job and also just a huge part of my heart's work, my labor of love. Um, and so a lot of what I wanna share today co really comes out of this work with Land in Common. Um, and so I think I'll, I'll share a little bit of background about that organization and then kind of some reflections on how we're navigating uh, the relationship between law and commoning. So Land in Common is a community land trust and land justice organizing community. We're formally, legally, we're a tax exempt nonprofit. Um, and informally, I think more importantly, relationally, we're a multiracial, multinational community of people working together to imagine and build pathways for land justice for land reconnection across a lot of different communities, especially BIPOC communities in Wabanaki. And um, we hold about 300 acres of land in two towns, which is home to, currently home to two worker cooperative farm businesses. Um, one of them is the nursery that I've been working at and a Latinx community farm, Presente Farm, that distributes free food to a huge community um, and then also a limited equity housing community, which is Wild Mountain Cooperative, where I've lived for the last 23 or so years. Um, and we just completed our first return of land to Wabanaki Care, um, 184 acres to Bamazine Land Trust, which is a, an all Wabanaki rematriation project that we work with really closely. They're really kind of like a sister organization walking together with us. Um, and so our, our focus is primarily on, on reconnecting Black, Brown, and Indigenous people with land, with long-term land care and land stewardship through both land justice practice, holding land in commons, and then also through land return. Um, and we're led by an all Black, Brown, and Indigenous leadership council, uh, which is not our legal board. And I'll say a little bit more about that later, because that's that's part of the the legal commenting dance that we're doing at the moment. Um, but our leadership council is made up of, of folks from many different communities um, in Wabanaki homeland. And, and a, a major part of this work is, is really asking the question, how do people from many different dispossessed communities um, who are often pitted against each other in the divide and conquer kind of uh, dynamics of colonialism and white supremacy come together to envision land justice together. So just for example, like how does land return to Wabanaki communities not get pitted against um, reparations and land reconnection for all the other indigenous communities that are here, but just displaced from their own homelands? And, and, um, and those are dynamics that really affect the communities deeply. So I'm I'm just kind of constantly in awe and feel really blessed to be a part of that as as a um, white accomplice in this work to just get to share space with these incredible organizers who are doing this beautiful hard work and who also are showing up in ways that I've really never experienced in my life, like being a part of an organizing project where people are so clear about the preciousness of the work, where the you know, the conflict that comes up in community inevitably is kind of, is experienced in light of the preciousness, in light of like this work is too important for us to let it um to let it die or to let our conflicts break us. And so I've been learning a lot about the the intimate heart-based, trust-based practices of commoning from all of my my dear friends and, and comrades here. Um and so we have a staff collective of three folks. I'm one of them. 
um, organized as a worker self-managed nonprofit, thanks in large part to inspiration from Sustainable Economies Law Center. And um, and we're and a lot of what we do is is you know both helping to convene this group but also interfacing with white landowners. Um, that's certainly the role of of the white folks who are part of this whole effort is really like working with uh, our own people on all of the deep processes of what it means to let go of the white knuckle grip on private property and land and control that comes with the infection of colonialism, the virus of white supremacy. Um, and so, you know, it often feels like therapy, like we're doing a lot of therapy. I mean, a lot of like work on mortality with older landowners, because that's really often what the question of land is about. I mean, it gets coded in all kinds of ways, but it's often about people struggling with letting go and and um, and kind of reckoning with what that means. Um, so I guess to focus on on law a little bit, I think we the organization started about 15 or so years ago, um, a bunch of organizers thinking about how do we hold land collectively kind of outside of the conventional regime of private property? Um, how do we find a legal structure that best matches our kind of broad values of wanting to pursue decolonization, land justice, something other than private property, but yet create long-term land security? Um, and what we found through our research is that here in the US at least, if you wanna permanently decommodify land, have people actually live on it, build direct livelihood relations with it, enable them to have long-term security and some limited equity, not have a landlord, then a community land trust is a pretty darn good bet as far as legal structures go. Um, and so we incorporated, formed a board, made bylaws, applied for tax exempt status, did all of our stuff. And I think initially our thought was, well, we gotta just do this in the most legitimate way we possibly can. So, you know, the task was like, learn how to really be legit. What are all the best practices? Um, and we did that for a number of years. And I think thankfully, thankfully we were also a bunch of anarchists. And because otherwise I think we might have gotten swept into thinking that that was actually the work. Um, you know, in other words, like following quote unquote best practices guidelines for the nonprofit industrial complex was actually the work. But I think we've been able to help each other remember constantly that the law um, is in many ways just a big scam. That that in in that the, the power of the state in part lies in, in in scaring us into thinking that we need to follow the law at all times or recruiting us as cops so that we're we're part of the process of trying to enforce the law with each other. Um, but I think it's been really helpful to try and apply Gibson Graham style analysis uh, of capitalism to the state. And so instead of thinking of the state as this big unified system that we're all inside of that, um, you know, is like a totalizing thing, um, you know, a territorial claim that's actually succeeded. That's what the state wants us to think. That instead thinking of the state as something that's produced in an ongoing way by a set of practices that include the stories we tell about it. Um, so thinking of the state as a set of distributed practices and relationships, much more like a network than a system. Recognizing that it's a network with bombs, a network with cops, you know, it's a serious network. We're not, this, you know, it's not a joke. That's not to reduce the power of it, but to remember that in a way, wherever the state is not, the state is not. Like that the 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 totalizing claim to territory is only held up to the extent that we that we perpetuate it. Like until the cops show up to enforce the law, the law is not yet there. I mean, I, and you know, it's kind of a weird way to think about it. I think for any of us who have grown up in the nation state, um, but it's a way that frees us to think really differently about how we relate to the law. And I think, um, you know, we're learning to think about the formal law as a game we play, not as the core substance of our organization. It's something where we're basically playing a dress up game for the state. We're putting on costumes, we're showing it what it wants to see so that it kind of looks in our direction and is like, yeah, okay. And then it looks away. Cause the goal is that we don't want it to pay really very much attention to anything that we're doing. Um, and, and so 
you know, in, in that sense, like I think more and more we're thinking about our kind of legal documents and legal structures as this state facing game where we're kind of trying to create, um, yeah, we're creating a face for the state, which is a little bit of a wall. And then we can kind of turn around and look internally and ask ourselves, how do we want to organize? Like, so we're, we're trying to build this space of freedom and understand what that space of freedom looks like. Um, and I think, you know, I'm finding that, that I used to think that the role of lawyers was to help us follow the law. And more and more, I'm seeing that, that the role of good radical lawyers is to help us actually see how big the space of possibility might be where we don't need to pay attention to the law. Like what is our space for, for creative possibility? And then where do we need to check the boxes in order to defend that space? Um, Ethan. Yeah. It, that's 10 minutes. Do you want to just have one more minute to wrap up? Um, yeah, I will. Wow, that, that could get good, really goes by quick. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think just to wrap up, I'll say that, um, I mean, I could give lots of examples, I guess, about about some of these things in practice and maybe in conversation, we can kind of get into those. Um, the last thing I'll say is that we've also been thinking a lot about doing law on the Titanic, um, that, that when you know that the Titanic is headed toward the iceberg and that you're probably not gonna be able to turn the ship, what does law look like? And I think thinking about our work as building escape vehicles taking apart the ship before it hits the Titanic and building different kinds of boats for, you know, on which everyone can actually find a possibility for a life, for a viable life. Um, and so that's kind of like another metaphor of how we kind of use the law and take pieces to build something that is really our own. And always asking ourselves, can what we're building survive the collapse of the legal structure that we're building it in relationship to? And that feels like a really important um, compass to help us make sure that that we're building something durable outside the structure of the state. So I'll stop there. Thanks, you. Wow, thank you so much, Ethan. Um, you just set us up so well for thinking about this conversation, and, and I hope we'll have plenty of time to come back and hear some more examples. So that was wonderful. Thank you so much. So Janelle, do you want to pick up from there? That was really great. This is going to be a good conversation. I love how much resonance and overlap there is, I think, in the things that we think about, Ethan. Um, I made slides. This is what I do, is think in terms of cartoons. So here we go. And I just dropped them into the chat because they're full of links. And um, so, yeah, I'm Janelle. I've been with Sustainable Economies Law Center since the beginning, 14 years ago. And we're based in Oakland, California on Ohlone land. And let me start the slide. There we go. Um, yeah, you can come back and see a gallery of the kinds of things that we're working on right now. But over, over our time, we've now we've counted it up. We've worked with 3,000 different organizations, meaning we've provided legal support to them, legal advice. Um, we do policy advocacy as well, a lot of research and education. But um, just over the course of time, working with about, well, advising 3,000 organizations, but also working very deeply with a few dozen of them, um, I'll share some of the takeaways and, and kind of a existential crisis that I've gone through and just realizing what works and what doesn't. Um, in Oakland, California, these are a few of my favorite clients. They're mostly land-based groups. They are they're rebuilding the commons. They're they're using land to grow food, to distribute necessary supplies, medicine to provide housing, sometimes free housing, other times very low cost. They're all I've worked with all of them for years now, and they're just uh, they are just full of love and joy, and I feel so much love and joy working with them. And yet. I, um, this is a picture of me. This is sort of drawing some of my reactions I started to have to the work a few years ago. Like literally I was getting sick. Like I, I kind of stopped digesting my food. I was breaking on rashes in weird places and also feeling like me that was happening to a lot of my clients, um, in these organizations who are working so hard, but a lot of them are coming up against legal barriers and I started to feel like the legal structures and the legal requirements that a lot of them were dealing with were kind of taking the heart out of what they were doing. And it it really varies, but I had to like 
ask myself, like, what is the heart of what it is we're trying to support? And, you know, there's, there's legal definitions of what is a co-op, but like, for me, I was like, at the heart of a co-op, it's just people together figuring out how to take care of each other. And that can take so many shapes and it, so many things end up blurring together, you know, blurring of self and other things flow according to love and inspiration and care, not according to like formulas and all of that. And like that to me is the heart of a cooperative, like that's the sacred core. And that of course is the thing that the law just can't make any sense of. Like the law likes things that are box shaped and very measurable. And um, particularly when it comes to trying to figure out how to regulate something or tax something, like the law doesn't like that shapeless, like formless heart of a cooperative. Um, and so what I found out that the law did sort of in retrospect, so this is me 16 years ago when I became a lawyer and I thought I'll be a co-op lawyer because there's a whole body of law just for cooperatives. I thought that's so exciting. I'm going to learn that body of law and I'll serve co-ops and we'll transform the world. It'll be great. But what I walked into was this very box shaped way of, um, basically constraining a lot of the decisions and the behaviors of cooperatives is like cooperative corporation law and tax law ends up um, basically forcing co-ops to adopt these formulas for how they make decisions and how they distribute resources. And so, yeah, just like, um, you know, quantifying all the ways that people interact with a cooperative and creating separate member accounts. So everyone has their own little personal box, their own little asset. Um, and all of it was starting to feel like, you know, like on one hand, we're taking normal corporations and we're re-engineering them to something more participatory and more equitable, but we're still reproducing a lot of the formulaic mechanistic ways of being. And that to me was like, that was starting to just take away what I felt was like the heart of what I wanted to support. And um and yeah, same in the realm of housing, like a lot of the things that I've advocated for and worked on for housing justice, again, it's like making these little boxes, boxes that separate people from each other and just turn everything into ever smaller assets. And so, um, yeah, and then of course, uh, the these a lot of these arrangements, these cooperatives that I've worked with involve so many legal documents, so much legal complexity that even when I make like legal documents filled with cartoons and I try to keep it simple. It's like, no matter what I do, somehow things get ever more complex. <laughs> they just get more and more complex. So that was like, I basically, I, I wrote something about a year ago. I put together a collection of my writings and videos that represented to me kind of looking at all the work I've done in the realms of energy, finance, housing, food, and just kind of said, here's what I think is actually not working. Like the true spirit of the commons or co-ops um, is sacred. And I want to figure out how to work with the law in a way that nurtures that sacred spirit and doesn't disrupt it. So lately I've been, a lot of my work has been focused on land return to indigenous people, because for me, that's one of the things that gets us closer to the more nurturing heart of what it is I want to support. And um and yeah, a lot of it is just moving us toward inhabiting a very different worldview, which I'm not going to talk about all the elements because I don't want to take up all that time. But, you know, just in case David doesn't want to self-promote this book, I think this David's book is probably the first time it really got into my head that, okay, the commons, it, it's a whole other worldview. It's like taking the way we think and turning it upside down and inside out. And so, yeah, I have some slides here on that, which we can come back to. But yeah, basically... When communities have a vision to do whatever it is, I want to put that at the center and just find ways to work with a law that kind of, um, where law can kind of shape itself around the edges of that, but like keep the aliveness of what people are doing in the center. So here are five things that are giving me hope in the law. Um, one is just generally like creating much less intrusive legal tools and legal structures. So there's a link to a lot of simple very simple seeds of legal documents that people could use to return land to indigenous communities. I've also been working a lot more with unincorporated associations rather than corporations, just so that the whole logic of corporate governance doesn't have to intrude uh, on a group's more caring ways of operating. 
working more relig with religious organizations just because the law tends to be much less disruptive of how they operate. Um, and, and then also when, when I do work with corporations like nonprofit corporations, trying to create much simpler, kinder bylaws. So that's one approach. Um, the next is still using like strong legal tools where needed to disrupt the very powerful institution of say private property. So um, I've been delving a lot into easements lately because easements, I like to say they ease the solid boundaries of private property. And I sometimes imagine we should just sort of plaster the world with easements that take privately on property, but then give other people access for whatever it might be. Maybe it's for conservation, but it could be a cultural easement. It could be um, allowing an indigenous group to access it for ceremonial purposes. Um, anyway, so I think there's a wide range of uses for easements. And I've, I've done a lot of work to just understand like what makes them legally enforceable. And I still put it all in a cartoon legal document, which is what I link to here. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there are times where we want to use strong legal tools. Um, and then there are other times where I'm just like, forget legal tools. Like, this group of people, like imagine it's a group of people that has formed an organization, they have purchased housing, and there are people living there. It's amazing to me how many times groups of people, they they just don't want to use written legal agreements. They want to manage things relationally. And I'm like, of course, that makes sense. That's how our ancestors did it. That's how so many people in the world inhabit this planet is not with legal documents and contracts. It's based on relationships of care. And so um, our clients, they get pestered by property tax assessors and other regulators to be like, well, we want to see the written lease agreement that you're using for your affordable housing. And so this is a, a link here to a statement I created for organizations that are choosing not to use these enforceable legal tools, um, but to adopt other kinds of practices um, that include like coming together in circles and sharing needs and, and making, um, you know, in conflicts come up, you know, navigating those together. Um, yeah. And a lot of this is, you know, groups who are really choosing to not call the police who are, who are for police and prison abolition. And of course, leases, lease agreements are documents that are enforced by courts and ultimately enforced by police showing up. And so our clients are rejecting leases in part out of their abolitionist values. Okay. Fourth thing is training the government to recognize, honor, and protect the commons. I mean, I don't actually know how to do this. I know in Bologna, Italy, you know, Christian Ioni has talked about how their regulation for the commons was able to, you know, support groups and, and not have the government interfere too much in how they operate, but just sort of honoring that a lot of commons-based organizations are very informal in how they operate, and and we should just sort of let them be that way. Um and so in Oakland, I'm I'm kind of always waiting for the other shoe to drop with so many of my clients. Like at some point, the law is going to come down on them in some way, usually for zoning, building codes, property tax related issues. Um, and when there's a the next crackdown, there's some groups we've been organizing trying to figure out what law do we want to put forward in Oakland or advocate for. And so we've written two different versions of a law, both of which try to sort of define commons, but I don't think we use the word commons in there. We use like care-based community or community stewardship projects. Um, but just like to say, okay, this is this is what a care-based community project is. And this is why the government needs to kind of step aside and stop like cracking down and trying to enforce really strict, say, zoning regulations on it. Now, about another minute. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then the last thing is just de-lawyering the law. And um, there's a three minute video I just made. I've linked it here, which is something I'm putting out there to my future. I don't want to call them clients anymore, but the groups of people that I work with, um, when I would normally be giving them legal advice, what I'm trying to create now is is sacred legal circles where we acknowledge that the law really does belong to everyone. Like we are all creating it together. It should exist to serve us and support us in what we're doing. And this thing of being a lawyer, um, I feel like it has actually, I, I feel like I've come to this place of where it's, it's limiting me and it's limiting the kind of things that I could come together with communities and do. And I, I really do feel like I, I want to 
give up my license to practice law possibly next year. And that would bring me to a space where I would, I would fully be inhabiting that space where law belongs to everyone. So I would love to talk to y'all about any of these five things or more. Um, there's definitely more to say, but I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Janelle. That's wonderful. And hopefully you'll get some more time to say the more things that you wanted to say. It was fantastic and great connections to, to, to what Ethan talked about. Um, okay. So, and I, I confess, I forgot to put the timer on at the beginning. So I kind of am fluffing the timing a little bit, but seems, I think I'm, it's good to try and try and cut people off so we can make sure we get through everybody and, and here. So Bronwyn, you're going to go next. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. And um, gosh, I, I'm also, I'm feeling deep resonance and also um, I'm actually going to start with something I was going to end with because it's so, um, so, 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 so let me just contextualize. So I'm a, um, I'm an academic. I do do a lot of work with um, sort of, I guess you could call them new economy communities or regenerative economy communities outside of um, my academic work. Um, but I teach at a law school, so I, I'm 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 at the, and the vast majority of the of the, the you know even the box that Janelle showed that is cooperative law is right on the edge, of in fact it's invisible in law school and um, uh, there's been some work and some calls done I know Emma's here she knows about this to get even those boxy cooperative laws discussed in law school but that's that's still not got much interest or support. Um, so we really, um, so I, I wanted to ex explore sort of five places which, where I think interesting things are happening, but moving closer and closer to this, this um, inevitable entanglement with, with the, the boxy formal law that, that does take the heart out of things and to keep seeing whether, you know, there's, um, where are the spaces for keeping the heart back in that. But the thing that I was going to say at the end that, connects so well to to what Janelle ended with was that I don't I don't know and I just I keep thinking about this over and over again is there a way of working with formal law in a way that keeps the heart in it or do you really have to actually step away from it altogether and purely treat it as a dress-up law and I'm going to pose like one question to Ethan um, just that we can come back to which is just noting that, you know, he talked about using the law as a dress up to make the state say, okay, there you are. Thank you. Now keep doing what you're doing. We won't look closer. But then you talked about law and the Titanic and what could we keep using? And it feels like they pull in opposite directions because we're unlikely to keep using the dress up clothes because they'll seem even more ridiculous than they already do, if that makes sense. Um, but, and, and so I, did this long project, um, a sort of four year project on the legal and regulatory structures that helped, I framed it at the time outside of the language of commons. I, when I came into the project, I thought of it as social activists who wanted to embrace social enterprise. Um, but what I came to realize was that, that I was more interested in um, sort of commons based than social enterprise was much closer to the, the formal boxes than, than I had realized. And what I found, one of the things I found in that project was that there were we, different career pathways where people flourished in these spaces um, with different disciplinary backgrounds or knowledge backgrounds and so on. And those that came from the law were both, I mean, I could say a lot more about this later, but they were both less, much less numerous in these spaces. And when they did um, appear, and I think Janelle was actually with me in Australia at one of these workshops where we gathered you know, we gathered a room full of lawyers who were incredibly excited about this. And the majority of them were thinking of or planning to or already had left the law. And to hear Janelle say that you're thinking of like giving up your license, I, I don't know whether a part of me wants to say yay and part of me wants to say no. This is, if Janelle's thinking of that, then that actually does mean that the prospects for formal law to keep the heart beating for commons alive is really thin. And then that raises another question which I think we should come back to, which is what is the, the risk and cost? You know, Janelle, you use the language of coming down on the communities and and Ethan's language of um, a network with bombs. Um, wow. I mean, I'm keeping that one in my head with, with uh, 
<clears throat> with a kind of a, a certain affect around it, but it's an intense phrase. It is a network with bombs. And so, so, I, but you know, as I say this, I realize that, you know, putting on the dress up clothes of formal law doesn't insulate you from the bombs and the violence either. So, so maybe it's just, it's just as a person teaching law students, this does confront me with with some dilemmas. So I'm going to give you five incredibly quick examples because I've probably only got six minutes left now. You've got five um, minutes left. <laughs> okay, one minute each. So I will signal to five examples, and these go along a spectrum of sort of being more and more engaged with the formal law, and and probably therefore less room for the heart. But the the first the first one. Um, these are just projects I've come across recently that um, that. I, I find stimulating and 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 hopeful, if not interesting. Sometimes not hopeful, but still always interesting. So the first one is um, this project on the Treaty of Finsbury Park, which Ruth Catlow, an artist in London, is working um, with a really sort of a mixture of live action role play games um, and actual playful performances in the physical space of Finsbury Park to. Um, to work on on the idea of an interspecies treaty between non-humans in the park and humans and to really treat to use the language of treaty um which is a legal language but to work with it completely outside the formal space of 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 treaty law and i just gesture to that because um so well uh, amy cohen and i have written a uh, article on prefigurative legality which is a more academic way of saying that maybe there's a way of taking back law to imagine it otherwise using the language of law. And I suppose all these five examples are, are, are sort of examples of this, but David might speak um, to some quite technical legal work that he's been interviewing people with about using these ideas of dialogues between non-human animals and humans um, to actually feed into quite formal law. So we can come back to that as well. If So that in, in, in many ways, what the artist Ruth Cathlow is doing is right outside of law, but it, there's a path from that to particular forms of self-owning land David might speak to. So the second example is a project called Beyond the Rules, um, which all sorts of organizations are participating in. And I do see a real hope in this, in that, so I'll just read you out the names of these these are mostly, well, they're all based in Europe, um, but they, the DEMSOC is De Democratic Society, non-profit, Black Thrive Lambeth, Dark Matter Labs, which is an incredibly creative um, consultancy on governance in general, Lankelly Chase, which is a philanthropist doing really interesting systemic change work, York Multiple Complex Needs Network. So all these people are looking at ways of inquiring into systemic governance and and actually, in some times, creating written documents, I suppose they're a bit like what Janelle's already talked about in some ways, those beautiful care documents we talked about. I think that resonates quite closely with that. But they do start to edge towards technical law sometimes. So there's, they've got a sub-project called Between the Rules with, um, with an entity in Birmingham where they've really looked at employment law and they've started to write contracts and work practice documents that are quite formal law looking like but the substance is totally different but they still think that it's probably at a guess consistent with formal law so it's between the rules no and and it's it's a beautiful project and um so that gets really quite into the nitty-gritty of something like employment law the third example is um amelia thorpe does this lovely work on um do-it-yourself urbanism but really just sort of the recent work on prefigurative infrastructure or she's got another article called insurgent infrastructure is really emphasizing that when you when groups work with places and objects in in the street um and then um they can they can do all sorts of um enact another world like draw, build those parks and so on that all started in san francisco but her recent work has started saying actually you can work a lot more with the state than you think in doing this so and san francisco department of municipal transformation is a play on transportation which just goes out and physically does um transforms the street and then and then really puts that as an offer to the state to are you coming with us or not in which case we'll just move on to the next place and do that um and and although that's technically illegal um they're sort of acting as an agency as a state agency um and pushing the actual transportation agency to start to act in different ways um 
And doing that through an object um, has a, if they keep everything very anonymous and bureaucratic, decreases the risk that I was talking about earlier where, of the state coming down. You know, even if it comes down on the object, it's better than coming down on someone's body or their bank account. Um, I I think, um, you know, I might even uh, stop. I don't want to go to, I mean, I could, there's lots more projects, but um, it get, it does get closer and closer into the complexity that Janelle talked about. So the, the fourth project, Dark Matter Labs, has another project called Trees AI, which is a play on um, artificial intelligence or uh, alternative infrastructure. That if you see trees as a as an infrastructure in the way that we talk about roads and gas networks and electricity, and but you keep the heart of what you care about for trees and their non-humanness. If you if you try to work with a city so that it can account for that in a literal legal and financial sense um, and develop the new tools to do that. They've been working with Glasgow City Council for two years to do this. But I have watched that project transform from an from something much closer to Ruth Catlow's Treaty of All Beings to a really technical policy report that just came out with alternative metrics and portfolio investment framework um, strategies. And, and it's that takes me back to, you know, do you actually really just have to stop being a lawyer and 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 then work on the, the 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 alternative governance practices with the heart that would be there when the Titanic goes down and stop even trying to attach those to the word law? I don't know. I I, I I'm going to end on an open question in that respect. And um, I think I'm thanks, Roman. You just on the on the dot of ten there. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I know you collapsed a bit, but we'll have more time. So um, last then, David, would you like to? You're un unmute yourself. Un yeah. Sorry about that. I am so stimulated by these presentations and the on the ground creativity. And I think that's where the engine for change is going to happen. So I resonate to Janelle's impulse to just dive into that world and abandon straight up law, but I do think that is going too far um, in the sense that we still need these interfaces with the law, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute. I mean, my as a commons advocate and scholar, I've been struck with how the commons, as they've grown in influence and size and ambition, they're inevitably running up against state law. And as everyone here knows, and, you know, sometimes it's commoning is criminalized and we need to find some sort of rapprochement with the state. And I think the basic problem is that Western jurisprudence and the liberal polity have so many deeply embedded premises about the human condition and economics and freedom and governance and property that is just incorrect or partial and uh, that somehow that needs to be negotiated and resolved, or at least a modus operandi worked out. And so the problem is, I think that there is a, a clash, an ontological clash, an epistemological clash, you could say, between what I call uh, state law or Western jurisprudence and commoning. And sometimes this comes down to what I call the difference between legality and legitimacy. And I think the commons often has the legitimacy of the social relationships and the trust and the care and much else. The state law is so distant from those commoning realities, if not designed for a different worldview and vision, especially pro private property, contract freedom, market relationships, capital accumulation, that there's just like an enormous mismatch between conventional law and what commoners aspire to do. And so the stories that we've just heard are really such evidence of that gap and how we need to creatively fill that void with creative alternatives. And I'm, I really want to dive into some of the examples that have been presented here. Um, I think it comes down to the fact that state law and state power have eclipsed vernacular law. They have more power. Positive law from legislatures and courts has sort of superseded uh, commons-based law or vernacular law. 
And commons is seen as this vestigial oddity that uh, has no standing socially or legally. So I think that is sort of just to restate the challenge of what's going on. But I mean, I what we've heard here and what in my own work I've tried to develop is that there are all these creative alternatives that are emerging trying to bridge it. And the term that I use is legal hacks, inspired by things like the Creative Commons and the general public license for uh, for software. And there's quite a few others, which are all workarounds that try to, in, in Ethan's terms, be uh, state facing or market facing to acquire minimal legality to work without being bothered. And I think that's a totally admirable goal. And in fact, some of those seemingly small minor legal hacks uh, have all these follow-on effects that are worth uh, thinking about. I mean, Creative Commons opened up an enormous space, even though some people criticized it for being based on property law of copyright law. So, you know, I, I, I we don't know where legal hacks are going to lead to. And I, I would just mention a few of these legal hacks just so we have them in our in our vocabulary for talking about them. There's things like the open source seed initiative that is trying to divide that has devised uh, legal contracts for the sharing of seeds versus them going proprietary. Uh, you, many of you have probably heard of Thomas Lindsay and his work on rights of nature. And more recently he developed what he's calling self-owning land, which is a provision that a landowner can apply to create land that will be stewarded by designated custodians, not just for fiduciary reasons, but for the ecological and intergenerational benefits. Uh, there's a lot of um, attempts to, I'm trying to think of here, uh, you know, things I'm inspired by things like the Potato Park in Peru, which was an attempt to give legal control over the biodiversity of potatoes in Peru to the indigenous people there, which has so far as a legal instrument held up uh, as a hack uh, to, to give them certain control. And I think that these kinds of things are really important, if only because it might be the first stop that people have exiting from the capitalist modernity worldview into something else. I know a lot of uh, cities in Europe, people are exploring commons public partnerships uh, with city governments, which I think are a more hospitable arena for this innovation to occur than state or national levels uh, because it's less ideologically driven, less captured by the big corporate players and capital, and it's more pragmatically oriented. So I think there's a lot to be said for that municipal and town-based experimentation. Um, in thinking about this more, more recently with some colleagues, a term that we've surfaced, which I find very useful, uh, is the term interface patterns. And extending the idea of pattern languages, which uh, Silke and I used in our book, Free, Fair, and Alive, we say, what are the interface patterns between the state or market institutions on the one hand and commons? And the idea is that instead of having a direct transactional agreement between those two parties, you create a sort of a third space, much like the international world has diplomatic protocols and zones of, to mediate and be a buffer between the two. And I think of the way literary agents or performing agents me, um, mediate between the creative artist and the market, such that it's not simply a transaction which the market is dictating what he does and the artist then panders to the market, but he has a safe creative zone for his creativity, his or her creativity in interacting. And so the idea of what are these kind of buffers and intermediaries or interfaces that we might devise to, uh, in whatever imperfect uh, way, negotiate a modus vivendi um, between the two parties. That's sort of what the foundations for uh, open, free and open source software communities do. They The foundations 
populated by the elders of that community can accept money, but the money from the tech world is not simply transactional. Uh, I suppose it might vary from one community to another, but it's intended to sort of reconstitute the logic by which the community interfaces with the market capital world. And you could say the same thing about, um, well, stakeholder trusts, you know, like the Alaska Permanent Fund, or there are instances of state granted authority to commoners to engage in specified types of commoning. I was fascinated to learn in Bangkok of how the the city government worked with the canal shanty dwellers to uh, sort of give them a quasi autonomy of uh, to le to legalize their shanties to use them as a social service vehicle, and, and so it's like there's some interesting things going on where you when you create this space. Or I also think of certain commons enabling infrastructures, which infrastructure is not simply to promote market activity and growth, but inter, uh, enabling infrastructures that help commoners be commoners so that it's not a heroic activity each time. You don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. It becomes more normal. I, I think of something like the, the website Open Collective, which has done a fantastic job of being the backend infrastructure uh, for finance and tax compliance and interface with the government in ways that a 12 person garden society couldn't do, but they're able to do that. So can we have more of these uh, infrastructures or I think I can think of certain well-developed commons that have these kind of structures, the way the co-housing or the um, Commons-based housing federation in Germany meets our syndicate is so advanced that they have a pay it forward fund to finance acquisitions of new cooperative and co-housing. And so they, and there's, that's a longer conversation, but there's a governance structure that could be rep replicable and it makes this stuff easier. And I think that Janelle is, uh, you're trying to pioneer this in developing care and creativity and commons-based um, governance that is not driven or circumscribed or, or um, defined by conventional state law. And I think that is absolutely the direction we need to go. Um, so David, do you want to wrap up in one yeah, more okay, Yeah, so I mean, yeah. I, I think we should get into this larger conversation, but I mean, I've been so invigorated by what was presented here because I think we're all from different angles sharing similar stories of how the law needs to change. And I think there's a spectrum of interventions from the raw vernacular law enacting itself for a, a post-collapse uh, survivability to things that right now in quasi-mainstream society can interact with conventional state law and be enforceable through it. So I'm a bit ecumenical in where that could be and the value of that, especially since we don't know how it's gonna bounce once uh, some of these initiatives take take part or take place and who's gonna join and what they might do with this beachhead of a different way of moving forward. So with that, I think we should just have a, a a longer, deeper, richer conversation here. Perfect. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks all speakers. Fantastic set of ideas that have come up there. I'm noticing we've been going for an hour, so I'm wondering whether we just have a five-minute break where people get up, walk around, have a drink, and come back. And in the meantime, um, I know I'm going to ask every, each of the speakers to kind of maybe pose some questions to each other, but for the people that are in the audience, if you'd like to kind of put some questions in the chat, that would also be good because we can come back to those too. So if that's okay, everyone just take five minutes out. We'll be back at five past the hour. Is that okay?
And the cartoons drawn by you? Mm-hmm, they are, yep. Oh, they're fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. That's, have you always been an artist? When I was six, I drew a lot of cat cartoons, but then I went on hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> And then it was actually when I became a lawyer, I, you know, I just like, in order to express myself, I just felt like I needed something else, like to get ideas across. And so I started Mm -hmm. cartooning. Yeah. So it's been about 16 years. Wow. Wow. It's a great, a great thing to do. It must be, it's a great way of drawing on a different side of your brain too, I should think. It's true. Yeah. In a totally different zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's really nice is that about half of my coworkers are cartoonists now too Mm so um it's become a little bit of a language uh, that we use in a lot of our legal documents and yeah Mm. Mm. wow we've got to liberate the inner cartoonist in us all Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) yeah these are just stick figures so it's like nothing (laughs) nothing that the average person couldn't draw (laughs) right well um we're all coming back in I'm wondering whether we go around the four of you and um, maybe get some questions from each of you of each other or topics that you want to pick up on. I know Bronwyn already raised one of Ethan um, and then um, and then we could open it up uh, beyond that. But how does that sound? Um, Yeah. So, I mean, Ethan, do you want to pick up the question Brahman raised or would anything else or would like to pose a question to others? Um, or Brahman, do you want to re re phrase the question? Um, yeah, I'm, to get I'm, 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 I'm oh sorry. No, I am on. Yeah. Not on mute. Um it, yeah, it was just about the way in which the 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 law of the Titanic might pull in a different direction from the dress up law for the state. Yeah. Or, or whether you know so so whether the latter actually entails sort of letting go of law but then David was kind of pushing back on that and I think I am too by instinct or if not by position up to a point so um I mean, I, I, I actually just thought it was a really I need to reflect more on it but it's a really interesting question what would be most useful even in you know a, a sort of a a collapse that not well not a collapse, yeah a titanic type scenario what would still be useful would any bits of the actual formal legal framework be useful um and and, and i mean it's partly a question to Danelle too because i i understand how you got to where you got to but you know when you spoke about how people don't want to use the written documents people do still fall out. I guess the question is, are those written formal articulations of specific obligations actually quite useful sometimes in situations of conflict? Or is it really even then again about using, you know, sort of abolitionist dispute resolution techniques, for example, um, instead of turning back to some contract? Ethan, do you want to jump in first and then maybe Jamel and then we could do another round? Yeah, I think um I think Bronwyn, what you're raising just I mean it, it leads to I guess some questions that are coming up for me too here. I think um I guess when I'm thinking about the Titanic, you know, I mean in, in a way I'm thinking about like we have to be building ways of relating with each other and commenting that just aren't dependent on the state, regardless of what, regardless of what's happening with the Titanic. The reality is that like what commenting is, is us coming together to figure out how we want to manage ourselves and, and um, relate with each other, or hold each other accountable for the agreements we make. Um, You know, I think in a way, you know, if we're playing dress up to distract the state so it doesn't see us dismantling the parts of the Titanic with which we're building lifeboats, that's great. <laughs> but I think I'm thinking of this too, like, you know, we could, in this world where everybody wants models, we could easily be accused of like, oh, you want everyone to live in a community land trust. And and I think that, uh, I mean, at least in Land in Common, we're all pretty clear, like, I don't know, you know, community land trusts are just an escape vehicle to get us toward 
closer toward the kind of world that we want to live in and and generations are going to have to rebuild the vehicles as we go like it's not like we're coming up with some you know solution for everybody we're just we're just escaping from the world that we've been given that we know needs to change um for our integrity for our survival for all all the things um but i guess like for me a, just a question that i have for for all of you really that i'm that i'm just sitting with all the time is about um Brian, when you brought up risk and i think the question of i mean I, I feel like i could make it sound easy like oh you just like show the state your costume and then you do whatever you want on the other side of the curtain <laughs> but it's so not easy because um the question of that boundary is really perilous. And like, when do we risk not doing the formal legal thing that everybody says is the way you're supposed to do it? And, you know, like Janelle, I feel like what, what Sustainable Economies Law Center does for me is it just like explodes open this universe of, oh my God, we can do it in so many different ways that we hadn't thought about. And, you know, it's both exciting, but, and it's also overwhelming, honestly, because, without guidance immediately on the ground to help me understand how far can we actually go without risking what we're doing and also like who gets subjected to that risk i mean for example we in our land return recently bombazine land trust and land in common negotiated together we worked out this draft of our own deed which was totally different than any deed we'd ever seen before and we felt like this deed actually says what we want a transfer document to say in a land return. Or, I mean, not, you know, that's taking it a little bit far. We tried to make it like legitimate enough that, you know, it could be plausible, but, but we showed it to the lawyers and Landon Commons legal team was like, I don't know, we've never seen anything like it. We did some research, no red flags really, but it's a big risk. And then the indigenous lawyer on Bamazine's side just said, no way. Because if we're going to transfer land back to indigenous people, we're not going to do it in a way that uses a brand new deed that nobody's ever used before that may or may not be enforceable. And for me, that was a real kind of like, oh, whoa, like a little bit of a wake up call. Like who bears the risks of our legal experiments? And and maybe that was the wrong call, but it's really hard for us to know. And it's why, like, I wish there was a an SELC in every state that I could just, like, hang out with people all the time talking about these questions. But because then I'm like, well, what, where do we find lawyers who are going to do this work and who are going to be diplomats between between the, the state and the sort of non-state spaces that we're creating in our commenting practices? And I get confused about that question of risk and experiment. So I'd, I'd love to hear folks' thoughts on, on how to navigate that. Well, Janelle, would you like to jump in? Sure, gosh. Uh, there's a lot of thoughts um, rattling around here. It's the same kind of thoughts that keep me up at night because, yeah, this question of risk, I feel like there's that risk that the state's going to come down on our clients and sometimes us. Um, that, that that's a fear. It keeps me up at night. And then the other fear is just this fear that if we work so hard to just comply with the law or wear the silly law costumes or whatever, it, it really is going to kill our spirits and make us sick. And I, I, I have these two pressures on either side of me sometimes. And sometimes I just don't know what to do. But what I do find is a lot of my clients are just they understand these risks and are so courageous and are just kind of willing to put themselves out there and take that. There's a lot of us who get scared when we, be when we believe that a risk, like a risk that I'm going to take is going to put someone else in jeopardy. Um, so for example, at Sustainable Economies Law Center, you know, we, we do things differently. We take a lot of risks, but then a lot of times we hold ourselves back and that's because we have a board of directors. That board of directors is different and well, is partially like there are people on there who are not part of our paid staff. And that's because under California law, you have to have a partially or a majority disinterested board of directors. So they're, they're disinterested. They're not doing the paid work. Um, but we're having to protect them because they're the ones who could be liable 
for the risks that the people doing the work are taking. And so there's a way in which like, I want to be able to work and support people to work in ways where we can be courageous and take risks and not worry about how it's going to put the whole organization at risk or other, um, or other people involved. Um, yeah. What else to say about all this? I don't know. I have been thinking a lot lately about just what are we creating now in the context of feeling like things will collapse and feeling like somehow a lot of these legal structures are not going to be what, what matters. It is the, the relationships. And, um, I was actually at a land back gathering, you know, land return to indigenous people gathering a couple weeks ago where we were talking about easements and we sang an easement. We, put the elements of an easement into a song. And then we had two sections of the group sing it in rounds to the tune of row, row, row your boat. And so there's something about like singing an intention in a group of people all together that to me almost feels stronger than a legal document. It's just like, this is a group of about 40 people who just sang together. They stated their intentions together and that will be memorable far more so than a legal document. And when our systems collapse and there's not going to be like a court to come, like to take a, an easement to, to enforce it, what will we'll hold up these agreements is our, our relationships, our relationships and the things that we did to reinforce them and, and set our intentions. So, um, and yeah, like I'm shifting away from contracts, but it doesn't mean I'm shifting away from agreements. Like we're all still coming together and making agreements um, and setting intentions together. It's just outside of formal law right now to me feels just more powerful and giving up my license to law doesn't mean I'm abandoning the law. It means that I'm just holding the law from a different place. Um, I'm still going to be very much in it and working in it. And, and, you know, the bar associations might come and knock on my door and say, hey, this is unauthorized practice of law that you're doing. And that's a risk that I'm willing to take because I want to have that conversation. I want to be like, what is this thing you call practice of law that you think you own lawyers? Um, so, and yeah, I'm going to be doing more of that outside of my organization too, um, just as an individual, because I don't want to put my organization at risk. So yeah, those are just a lot of miscellaneous thoughts. I just wonder how... How does something like a singing an easement, uh, how durable is that? Like, what? How, how does that sh translate to the next generation and so on? And, and I mean, obviously, in the past, Commons knowledge has been passed down generation to generation. So it seems like they're the kind of new relationships we need to be thinking about how to um, develop so that something like that could. But David, it looks like you are really wanting to jump in there. So please go. I'm provoked by all of these. I have a few unrelated <laughs> thoughts, but one was um, I love the singing because it reminded me of how this group called Solar Commons, uh, which is a community neighborhood based uh, energy generation, which goes into a trust that they control and dole out their legal deed for their agreement as by their own description is a big public mural that's absolutely beautiful in a prominent space. And they regard that as the community's expression of their intentions, publicly stated, and, and you might even say the artistic dimension is an important part of that. It's not secondary. So I, I like that idea of pioneering that different form, but it also reminds me of two other things that maybe are more conventional. You know, if the state can charter corporations, why can't it charter commons? And maybe Janelle could explain that. Why can't we have a commons-based form with perhaps some uh, rough performance criteria without, but or does that open the door for state-based intrusion? But I'm, it's like, we need that form. I, I know a, a lawyer in Germany, Johann Steudel, who's working on an idea that he calls the commoners agreement which strikes me as similar to a limited liability partnership where you um, as a group have an agreement and I don't know enough about how that would interface with state law and how enforceable it would be. But it, again, it's an attempt to carve out a space where it has um, sufficient public facing legit legality 
but of course it's on their own terms. And so I was just thinking in those terms. And then the, a final quick thought is the term I encountered, which helps for me conceptually think about a lot of this is how the cultural dissident Vaclav Havel, when he was a dissident and not the president of the Czech Republic, used the idea of when there's a totalitarian totalizing system that you can't reason with, you can't penetrate, it's too all encompassing. What do you do? He said, you create a parallel polis horizontally outside mm -hmm. of that system and you develop the relationships, you develop the prefigurative institutions. And I think that's the space that we're kind of in. Mm -hmm. We have to develop horizontally a parallel polis that minimally necessarily as needed has to interact with the state, but that should not be the primary goal. Um, mm -hmm. So those are just a few thoughts that you've provoked in me. Who would like to jump in next? Um, Douglas, you've got a question. Yeah, jump in, please. Yeah, thank you, everyone. This is uh, this has been uh, very, very rewarding um, listening in. I've, I finally got stationary, so I can I've got a chance to put some notes down. Um, <clears throat> I'm just thinking across uh, countries. You can probably hear from my accent. I'm, I'm from Minneapolis, and I've been in Australia since 2014. I'm doing my PhD at ICS now, uh, at, at uh, Institute of Culture and Society, and I'm looking at this kind of, uh, I guess, one of the um, areas to think around is really the just sustainability space. And you know, I, I'm just listening to the difference, and I think uh, the approach to, of of how to contend with some of these legal challenges around commenting. Um, you know, from what I'm hearing by some of the folks uh, in the States versus what I've experienced in my attempts to try to talk about just sustainability or, or you know, uh, cooperative economic development uh, here. And just the difference in terms of the perception or the way to think about the interaction between the state, the role of the state as a barrier and enabler or an enabler um, to some of these, you know, things like community land trust and things like that. Um, so just as a bit of background, but I just want to speak... Um, I, to a couple of things, I think uh, it was Ethan that was mentioning around the um, the idea of taking apart the Titanic as as you go. And for me, the, the visual that came to mind was uh, I don't know if anybody's seen the the the, the film uh, Moana. The, it's a it's a cartoon. Um, uh, there's a the scene in there. There's a group. This is based on some of the uh, the cultural uh, history, but there's a group called the Kakamora, and um, they're basically there's a scene in this film where. Uh, these are these are pirates and they have these this large boat that just disassembles as they go about kind of attacking other boats um, and then it's able to to reassemble. So I guess the, the imagery that came to mind when I was thinking about, you know, you, you're dis, dismantling the Titanic to create these kind of escape vessels. But then I thought about if you think about from a design perspective, designing a boat that actually has the ability to kind of decentralize or to kind of, um, you know, modify itself to be able to either avoid a, an iceberg or to do other types of things. It's just kind of something maybe to, to riff off if you ever get a chance to see uh, see that uh, see that film. So something to kind of keep in mind, just kind of going on that uh, conceptual theme. Um, but the other thing that kind of comes to mind, particularly hearing about, you know, this kind of acknowledgement that there doesn't seem to be that there's going to be a, you know, a, a breakdown in, in a lot of the things that we think about and, and concerned about today and may not necessarily be the concerns of tomorrow. And it just stri strikes to me kind of the need for, um, you know, thinking about different types of people along maybe where they're positioned on this kind of antiquated left right axis. And I think about, you know, bringing together permaculturalists and preppers. Right. Like they're, they're kind of they're doing some very similar things, I think, in some ways, but uh, they're maybe not talking to each other. And I think that that talking to each other in terms of getting outside of these these boxes of political um, kind of you know boundaries that people align align with can do something towards kind of potentially getting people to think about, you know, whether it's legal ramifications for living together differently into the future uh, or what have you. But I just. Again, some kind of conceptual things that they popped up, and I'll just close with um, the uh, the idea of uh, the, the 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 music, and um, you know, singing singing the uh, the about easements. Um, 
I came brought to mind. I'm, I'm an artist myself. I, I'm a, a lyricist, poet, rapper. And uh, a couple of years ago, I was engaged in, in Minneapolis to write a jingle for an, uh, a community energy, uh, like a, a basically the, a community solar utility that was positioned on top of a roof in, in the North Minneapolis, which is a, a lower income community, uh, predominantly black. And basically that solar uh, utility then is uh, was trying to get renters and people in the community to be able to benefit from solar technology and, and you know, those benefits. And I wrote this jingle and um, and performed it at, you know, the community festival. And and um, I thought for me, it was cool because I got, you know, 500 bucks to do something that I love to do, which is, you know, write, write raps and, and perform. But more importantly, the um, I thought that the, the scalability of jingle writing for community based organizations or commons based, whatever type of solidarity, economics, you know, whatever frame you want to put it in, I think it's got incredible potential to kind of take that concept, right? As you're talking about in terms of doing a song about something and, and you got in that moment, you got all those people collectively, but then think about if you can hit play or hit, you know, send and then the kind of viral ability of that um, across the different types of organizations applying a, you know, a similar approach. So um, anyway, there's lots of other ideas came to mind, but I just want to thank everybody for for what they what they've raised today, and uh, it's given me a lot to think about. Thank you. Thanks, Douglas. Thank you. I mean, it, I, it, more and more it comes up in our conversations in the Community Economies Network is the intersection of art practice and um, and economic, you know, activism and so on. And um, so. This is just another, and you know, the, to talk about Finsbury Park and all these other things that came up in the examples, but that really just shows that this this is a way in, I think, and potentially a way in that's going to be a much more um, soulful or kind of uh, something that's going to feed our souls more than some of the kind of ways in which we've had of presenting arguments and you know writing books and so on. But I'm just wondering whether we, I could just come back to Ethan in the, that point that you meant about talking to people and the white knuckle kind of private private property clinging on to it and how those conversations go when you're and that whether they're preppers or not or permaculture people or whatever but how those conversations with landowners are happening in Maine and to what extent you know the kind of understanding of subjectivities and multiple subjectivities that come out of the work that we've done in the past helps in those conversations or not. Um, and I'm, I know I'm taking the chair's privilege here of inserting another question, but please get ready to ask other ones after this. But do you want to just talk a little bit more about that process of how you do that kind of discussion? Yeah. Um, I mean, we've, we've put out a call for land that, that was coordinated between our leadership council and a few different Wabanaki leadership structures. Um, and so through that, people are connecting with us. I think that... It's been really good learning for me to see how the conversation about private property pushes against internalized colonialism and whiteness in ways that I that are just that are deeper than almost anything I've experienced. Like I, I think that that as radical as people's politics gets, there's there's this way in which private property is kind of like a hard line that is very, very difficult for people to cross. And I think I've been finding that it's really important to start talking with people about, about that line and about the consequences of drawing that line for our, for our, uh, our souls. I mean, I don't know what else to, to say, but, but in the sense that for, for folks who are embedded in that private property system, for us to see that as something which basically sets up a situation where we have to betray the land in order to live. I mean, to the extent that the land is a commodity that we've been forced to rely on for retirement, sending the kids to college, whatever it might be that, you know, core livelihood things that we might love the land and experience it as, you know, a living presence and all of that. But the extent that eventually it becomes a commodity, we betray it. And to be put in the position of feeling forced to betray that land in order to do other things that we love. I mean, that feels like an immense harm that I want people who are embedded in private property to actually feel. And I think that's where 
we can start to make the connection that colonialism isn't just a decolonization isn't just a thing that white folks show up to as a charity on behalf of oppressed people. It's actually, you know, uh, the name of one of the core structures of harm that we're all implicated in and that is harming us all. So trying to kind of like unravel that and and reimagine the necessity of challenging private property for our own survival and thriving, regardless of who we are, feels like a really important piece. But it's also really hard to look at. It's really painful to look at and it's scary. And um, I mean, it generates a lot of tears sometimes. So I, I think like you're right to say the the question of subjectivity is absolutely central. And I don't know. I mean, we need a much bigger infrastructure of social care and collective therapy and um, to be able to do that work. I mean, we don't know yet how to, we'd have to sit at people's kitchen tables for a thousand hours to get them to work through some of the issues that would lead them to release private property in a way that really redistributes control. And we don't have the capacity to do that. So we're asking ourselves, like, what are kind of more collective group based pedagogies that might help people move through that process? And, you know, I think there's a question of, of capacity, but, you know, we imagine bringing people together in some sort of longer process where they can actually work through it together with each other, um, you know, which is totally something that 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 has been shown so so often in community economies work to be exactly the magic space where it's not just like the one-on-one -on -one, but it's that communal process of people reflecting with each other so that I, that feels like a next step maybe that's a a retraining that people who are stepping out of law could be doing <laughs> have to hold those kinds of conversations yeah um Catherine you've got a question in there um, you want to jump in? Sure, thanks. I actually, I think the question's um, almost, it's just me thinking through what I'm hearing and trying to absorb it because I feel like you've actually all already are answering this question. <laughs> but the the frame that I'm hearing it through is in a is in a real conundrum that I'm very much in at the moment, which is that tension between... Uh, trying to do the hard work from within the systems and structures that I have to work in. Um, and my interactions with the state are not through the law, but they're through the, the institutions of, of local government and the institutions of the Department of Foreign Affairs who are doing aid and development work. Um, and I feel like you're, you're all talking about with the sort of dismantling of the Titanic and the, um, the wanting to step outside of state spaces and outside of a formal registration as a lawyer, right? You're talking in a way about this tension between when and how do you choose to work in the system versus finding the spaces outside of it in which you can achieve stuff. Um, and I, one of the things that I'm thinking through at the moment in my work is the way I've been doing my work has been very much trying to identify the cracks in the hegemonic system that we're in, you know, where are those cracks? How do we broaden them, widen them? How do we let the light in? Um, and have been inspired by David Spillman, who's an Indigenous colleague of mine, who talks about setting cultural burns. And in Australia, the burn, the cultural burn is is not a destructive thing. It's, a, it's what you do to care for land. Um, it's the way that Indigenous people here have managed land for eons. Um, it's what allows for us to avoid really catastrophic forest fires and allows a sort of regeneration of life on the land. So a cultural burn is a slow burn and a gentle burn and a cool burn. And you do it by setting fire and allowing the fire to trickle through the forest, to take hold in places where it will take hold and just kind of manage that and let it happen really gently. And he speaks about his work as being that work, he's trying to change the education system in Australia, that's his aim. But he's just kind of working in this school where there's an opening, working with this little group of teachers over here who are kind of willing willing to engage in the way that he wants to do things. Um, but what I'm hearing is, you know, like for you, Janelle, the, 
that cost to your health of that is too high in a way, right? And um, and Ethan, you're talking about playing the game in order to create spaces where you can do what do the real work while not being visible. Um, so it's kind of the conversations about not the burn that opens up spaces within the system, but trying to find ways to kind of step outside it. Um, is that, am I hearing that? Do you think I'm hearing you correctly? Do you have some thoughts or reflections around that and where there are spaces to do that kind of cool burn within the structures and the systems? I think it's a very circumstantial question. Yeah. It's very circumstantially driven. I would, that's the short answer I would say. Yes, although I was also going to say there's a sort of, a, 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 to a certain degree, an element of quite conscious choice about it. I, that's what I sort of partly hear from Janelle, that you're kind of, and depending on different people's work and financial circumstances, the degree to which they can, I mean, we all have more room to move than we often acknowledge to ourselves, I, I think, probably. But but to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, do the work of bridging um, some of those who've never even thought about these issues with opening them up to that, which necessarily means that you'll do less in-depth work on the really sort of radical change. I, I think there is a sort of a choice. And I, I mean, I just came out of a class. I taught 50 students in a class that, didn't even run some years. I've changed the title of it so many times to try because it, 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 it it's essentially about, so it was called this year, Urban Sustainability and New Economies, um, Law, Urban Sustainability and New Economies. And whether it was just by chance or, but it, it got three times the number of students it's ever had. And often it hasn't even run because people don't, can't pigeonhole it. But I got, you know, large numbers of very straight down the line, foreign students, with second language English, who were interested very broadly in sustainability in the most anodyne way. And they they studied commons and diverse economies. And I and I put I put a much more sort of radical spectrum of literature in for a master's law course than, than I had before. I had your article, David, on hacking the law. And and the basic sort of what I've have come, come away with is two things which go in slightly opposite directions. One is they're all open to it even the mayor of um one of those northern sydney suburbs um i had the one of those quite wealthy northern sydney suburbs i can't remember which one but anyway he was elected mayor during the class i thought he might be a bit hostile but um they're all really open to it and many of the foreign language students it was sort of they said transformational like they've, they've they're considering careers they've never considered before they've got, seen a perspective on the world etc but when I see what they write they they baby you know they can't disentangle from their assumptions of formal law and private property and individualism and everything but they feel that like they've had a transformational so that I'm still thinking about that that matters like I mean it doesn't mean that I could do particularly interesting work on the written page with them yet but if 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 just in one fairly short course they can have a change of affect and open-mindedness and curiosity. But it's it's a choice about whether to do that work where you can actually dig into the specificities of it in a really exciting way. And often the other thing is, just, just to close, is, is that they think, I fear that they think they're much more interested than they are. And that when they realize the full implications of what they're being exposed to, they'll back off because mm -hmm. it'll just be too, too difficult or too challenging or not what they mm -hmm. thought. Mm -hmm. um so there's that yeah thanks Robin um Emma has a question I think she wanted to talk about it and uh then we'll have some time for everybody to have another statement I think before we end so Emma yeah thank you um this has been a you're very quiet I think oh, can you it's, make... it's not audible yeah. Just while it's Emma's almost, getting ready, she yeah. has recently finished a PhD all on cooperatives in Catalonia and uh, done quite a bit of interesting And work she did, on. she actually assisted me with this class and, and was a, it yeah. was just miraculous to have her there. So she's gone through that experience with me. Um, 
but we, no, we, we yeah, can't we, hear we, you. Sorry. I don't know anything, what, really. Sorry. Something's gone wrong with your hear microphone. Your mic volume in Zoom. Mm. Mm. You maybe take the headphones out and try this with the mic. Say it without the headphones, maybe. Oh. Right. Yeah. Well, maybe while we're trying to to figure that out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyone else want to raise a question or a thought that or or give more uh insight into a particular example that people touched on? I know Janelle, you wanted to say some more at the end of what you were saying. Can you remember where you were at? <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I was just, um, yeah, I will share that. I, I really am just in a moment of feeling conflicted about if or how to get involved in policy change. And, you know, as David was saying, like cities and towns are probably the ripest place to be, um, doing experiments and, um, city of Oakland for me is the most obvious place. Cause that's where a lot of the work I'm doing is. And, the government gets a tiny bit better. You know, sometimes our friends run for city council. Maybe there's a possibility that things could change. But I do feel like most of the time when we've done policy advocacy, it really does um, end up uh, resulting in laws and policies that were really pointless to have not like pointless at a practical level. They don't really make a major material change. But what does happen in the process is we build community and we organize and, you know, we build collective power. And I, I, um, I do help. feel like the, the, that state power and law is still so important when it's acting to contain and protect us from domination and power. And more often it's the source of domination um, and supporting capitalist markets. But um, I I really want to um, pass a law in Oakland that bans absentee land purchases, you know, because big corporations are coming in and just grabbing up land, especially in home foreclosures. And I, I was recently traveling internationally to various places on a sabbatical and realized in a lot of other parts of the world, it's not legal for outsiders to come in and buy the land. Um, and I, there's nowhere in the U.S. that I know that that, that is the case. But um, I may start to get involved in that kind of advocacy because otherwise I just think we won't have space to build the commons. We need to kind of, um, yeah, stop the the flood of absentee purchases, purchases coming in. So I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about getting involved in advocacy, but also feel conflicted about it because I don't know how far we'll get. Yeah, because the actual people won't be in the city. <laughs> They're just the empty apartment blocks, which is what's happened a lot in the city as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Emma, do you want to try again? Is it um, any um, better? Can you, can you hear me? That's can you better, hear me? yes. Oh, you yeah. can. I was just starting up my other Mac. No. I mean, the other laptop. Um, okay, hang on. Let's close some little doodacky windows I've got open because I can't see you <laughs> actually um okay so this has been fantastic I'm uh I'm a social scientist I'm, but I'm now studying law and I feel like Janella starting that pathway of learning the boxes but then perhaps hopefully you know looking at what you've all been doing to figure out you know where it, where it doesn't matter so much um and I just finished taught um and during that subject I was kind of disappointed because it didn't cover class action so much I was thinking well, what's the what's the potential to actually you know join together for people to to set precedent rather than you know it's an individual risk um, or, or fighting it out and I started to think about in this dialogue we've been having this morning about whether though tools such as class action could be used to make material harms that are generated, you know, by the state law and legality. Um, there appears to be a lot of insights that are coming from the community economies and commons-based practices and whether, whether those insights are useful in terms of, um, you know, exposing, exposing, you know, the harm in a different way uh, or, you know, the kind of harms generated by private property and, you know, these mm -hmm. environmental kind of um, harms and whether whether it then 
becomes a tool to open up the legitimacy of, you know, commons-based practices or something. I'm, I'm not able to formulate the question properly, I don't think, but this is just something I was thinking about. Hmm. I think there's been some good experimental lit litigation and some of it's not just experimental, like our children's trust is bringing a class action on behalf of children against the US government, government for failing to protect the atmosphere and our ability to thrive on the planet. And that one's moving through the courts with some success. And then, um, and of course, all of the litigation around rights of nature um, you know, around the world has been really innovative in that way. Um, yeah. I'd like to make the case for thinking big. I think discourse is a really important part of all this conversation. I remember years ago when I first got into the commons, people say, oh, why don't you just talk about the common good or public interest? And it was because there's a different logic, a different ethic, different practices and so forth. And I think that uh, the people in Bronwyn in your class, their affect may change, but unless they can have a discourse to grow into and develop, they're not gonna solidify that. And that was one of the insights Silk and I had in writing Fair, Free, Fair and Alive is that we have to invent a different language and discourse and concepts to, to bootstrap ourselves up. And I've been very frightened lately to realize all the authoritarian, if not fascist, uh, legal thinkers who are doing precisely this of imagining a post-liberal world uh, for the state. Uh, Catholic, Catholic integralism, for example, which would blend Catholic with the Catholicism with the state and other things like that. Our side doesn't have any sort of discourse like this, which I think is very important for giving permission, uh, crystallizing the ideas, and encouraging the alternative vision with a certain durability or a vision. Mm. And I think that, so I think that a lot of the examples we're talking about here, can we organically grow a larger discourse to talk about them as an alternative space? You know, I so can I talked about relationalized property. More recently, I've been thinking about concepts of relationalized finance precisely to get out of the commodity property discourse and start to validate a different set of categories for talking about commons stewarded um, care wealth is the term I prefer over resources. Uh, da, da, da. So I, I just wanted to put that on the table. Just on that, David, um, I mean, I'm, I've been amazed about it, that the way in which this social and solidarity economy discourse and and definition has been adopted now by the UN, the ILO, the OECD. They're That's all true. putting out these statements that they support the social and solidarity economy, which, which protects collective interests and general interests and is about surplus and redistribution and so on. So it's 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 amazing. Um, and I'm kind of thinking, well, where's the similar on commenting and against private property? Because in a sense, it's really arguing against private appropriation of wealth and and the and the safeguarding of collective interest. Um, and it, it seems like it's getting a lot of traction, which means that it's meaning that states can now um sign up to supporting social enterprise. You know, in the Philippines, there's a new um, uh, law that's going to be in implemented very soon, and there's been rapid growth in, in social enterprises and so on. And I just wonder where the commoning movement and the social and solidarity economy movement might be brought together to some extent. And so that that, because of what, what basically what the UN and others are saying is this is the only hope we have to start meeting the SDGs mm -hmm. <laughs> because they know that business as usual has failed, you know? And I think that we need to have a, a small summit of those various movements relevant and start to put some intellectual stakes in the ground or philosophical stakes in the ground saying this matters lest the UN or the nation states start to co-opt even the solidarity economy. Yeah. It's a huge yeah. advance that the UN has recognized them, but doesn't have yeah. the internal internal yes. analysis. And I think it's just before Brahman, just a second, I think I think you're right in terms of being trying to counter and think ahead of the right wing. I mean, I think in Australia we've just seen 
an example of the left allowing and progressives allowing the the Steve Bannon you know playbook totally walk over our referendum around indigenous rights and 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 not and people not being able to jump ahead of the arguments that kept being put out against you know a voice to parliament for indigenous people and there's a there's a need to mobilize around this counter that has to be ahead of the game um, so I really I really think that is a, an imperative sorry Bronwyn you hit you go ahead no, no, it's it's great everything you're saying. I'd forgotten about the um that aspect of the social and solidarity economies being adopted at international level, but I think that's a really interesting um just building on basically what both you and David are saying. I happen to be so the New Economy Network of Australia, which I'm on the board of, is the Oceania representative on RIPES, which is the social and solidarity mm. network. And and I, I often feel like all the meetings are horrendous hours. I never can go in person. And I feel a bit overwhelmed by the paperwork's confusing to follow. But I have gradually, so I haven't been as present as I probably should have been, but I have gotten the sense that, well, first of all, exactly what you're saying, it's quite a big deal that these UN, ILO, even the OECD, which I really was surprised. And then I started to get worried about were they co-opting and so on. Um, <laughs> And of course, that's a po possibility, but there's a lot of really dedicated grassroots organizations in the network that have been working for decades at a very local scale, who are very committed to the ethos of solidarity economy. And I think that's right to pick up on that probably not all of them are oriented to commons or challenging private property in particular. So it's a little bit more of a sort of a grassroots welfare state thing. But there's also an interesting politics going on, which took me a while to figure out, and no one will talk about overtly, but um, behind the big statements and the reason they've, part of how they've got up there, it's been decades of work by the people, particularly, um, I think the, the French and the Montreal kind of co-op um, scene, um, and Latin America, there's a tension between the French have a kind of social economy approach to it. So there's a whole forum called the Global Social Economy Forum, which happens every year, which is in tension with the social, with the repairs. And it's more state-based, it's more top-down, and it, I don't think it's at all commons-based, and it's certainly not challenging private property. In contrast, the Latin American networks have a lot more going on. And I just suddenly thought when David said integrationist, Catholic integrationists, and there's the, the original potential of liberation theology, the, 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 the left take on Catholic and and who was saying they were working, Janelle, working more with religious networks. And I, I, I agree that some sort of almost like, it sounds like it's detached from the practicalities of um, kind of on the ground work, but, the, but that big picture philosophical discourse, um, discussion, I mean, it could go nowhere, but if it's done in a really rounded way, and, and as you say, focused on getting ahead of the game, um, yeah, it's quite worrying what's going on on the right. So, so we've I only think... got about eight minutes left. Um, sorry, Bromond, I didn't cut you off. No, no, I'm, I'm just yeah. thinking aloud now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just wondering whether our, the panellists would like to make one last comment. Um, Douglas, do you want to just quickly slip in there first? And then yeah, 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 just quickly, um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, thinking about um the track two diplomacy, and I don't think it would come anybody's come across that, but this kind of mode of peer-to-peer uh, -peer diplomacy. Um, and I guess where I started thinking about that was this this notion of having to um, you know, uh, engage with the state actors in some cases or you know, the financial industries. Um, to try to, you know, either bring attention to this, to raise awareness, educate, advocate um, towards some type of action or, or policy implementation or intervention. And, um, you know, I just thought about, you know, the, the, in, in corporate settings, they talk about champions, right? You're getting a champion of some whatever organizational change that they're, they're going about. Um, and, yeah, I just wonder if there's something to kind of, you know, use there in terms of thinking about, you know, embedded within each of these organizations are human beings who do oftentimes have certain values aligned um, to comedy type practices or community economies type practices that um, they're oftentimes, you know, yearning for the opportunity to engage and, and to be engaged in, in those type of conversations. So I just, 
I think there might be something to impact there again, track two diplomacy, uh, peer to peer uh, diplomacy. And these are ways to think about engaging. Um, these are typically used in the, in the sense of international forum and in trying to avoid having to have the state mediate in terms of what diplomacy actually looks like for, for everyday people. But I think there could be some adaptation potentially in terms of thinking across working uh, across societal sectors in the same sense. I wonder if that also intersects with what David was talking about, about these interface patterns and people that could potentially be in those interface. I don't know whether I got you, you know, understood exactly what you were meaning there, but it seemed like a very productive idea, um, place to work. So, um, you just went on mute, Catherine. Sorry. <laughs> Getting a bit ahead of myself here. Would you just like to make one last comment before we wrap up? Because we've only got five more minutes. It's been such a generative conversation, I know. Um, and I'm not sure, where, you know, if people would like to continue it in some other format at some other time, but any any last thoughts would be great to hear. So, um, I don't know, David, do you want to go first? I, I've said plenty. Uh, I would just... I, I've just am thrilled at the, what's all been presented on the table here. It's given me a lot to reflect on. So let me just pass the, the baton to, I don't know, Ethan. We haven't heard from you in a bit. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I think, um, I mean, there's so much. It's really awesome to share the space with you all. I'm swimming with ideas. I think just to reflect back one thing that I think I've learned from from you all in this conversation, thinking about painting agreements on a wall and singing agreements. And I was thinking about like, what are the common threads? And it helps give me a framework for talking with, with my fellow organizers about this idea of, of relationships, recording and ritual. I'm thinking about like, it's rooted in our relationships, but then we have to figure out how to record our agreements in some durable form that we can pass mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And that could be painting, weaving, singing, writing, whatever it might be. And then what's the ritual that we use to kind of like revisit that and remember it and keep it alive in our relationships. And it feels like kind of a circle. And mm -hmm. that, so I just, that's a gift that I just got that I want to bring back and use with, with folks. Mm -hmm. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you, Thank you for that. Um, Janelle. I love how you just sum that up. I was just taking notes. That's wonderful. I guess I'm I'm just sitting here still with a lot of questions. I was uh, really intrigued by what David was saying about interface patterns and the need for these buffers or these intermediaries, um, which is probably a lot of what I've ultimately worked uh, with as a lawyer. And those are the those uh, buffers are the ones where I find um, that we start to lose heart after a while. So it makes me curious about the ones that inspire you and like, is the heart of common still in them, the ones that have grown to be larger institutions like the syndicate in Berlin? And... Fair question. What's that? It's a fair question. It's a question, yeah. So that's a question I'm still sitting with. And also, yeah, could, should the state uh, allow people to charter commons entities? I've grappled with that one a lot. I would love to hear if people have thoughts on that at any point in the future. Um, and... Yeah, and I think I want to write more jingles now. <laughs> Good conversation. Thanks, y'all. Thanks. Roman, did you want to make a last comment? Just, just two tiny things. One is just, I, I I love Ethan's formulation as well. And I don't th know that, I mean, you could have the recording, the relationships, and some sort of legal enforceability. Like if it was on the, if it was an a title on an easement, I mean, an easement sitting on a title that could be passed down no matter who bought the property, then that's great. And, and that doesn't sort of, that doesn't seem to me to sit badly with singing it and um, and recording it and doing the ritual and so on. They can coexist in that particular instance, at least. The other thing is to, um, uh, to suggest a, a book called Walk Away. I don't know if anyone's read Corey Doctorow's Walk Away, but there's a lot today I mean, it's in some ways totally different, but it's it's a it's a whole lot of mostly initially young people, and they just walk away, and they they start crafting different institutions, practices, and um, leave behind 
um, and, and, and then they're followed by some academics and then it doesn't go that well. But it's not dystopian either. And it's just, a I, I recommend Walk Away by Dr. Wright. <laughs> so. Wow, thank you. We've even got reading to do now. <laughs> and it sounds like uh, we, de we definitely need to have a singing workshop for the community economies <laughs> at our next Naviana conference. <laughs> um, and I also have this image of an incredible kind of summer school of people learning to be those people within the interface patterns but without losing heart. Um, it seems like yeah. there's a whole retraining for people who have been attracted to law but really want to move into this other field and it would be a great kind of place to be offering options for what they could be working on um, there's so much richness out there um, to share um, but let me uh we, we should really wind up it's been a wonderful two hours uh, for some of you on sunday afternoon yes <laughs> that's great accountants and consultants exactly um I've got so much out of this conversation. I feel like I want to go and listen to it again at some point. This will be up on the YouTube um, for the Liviana conference so people can listen to it. I'm sure there's there's so much information there that people could use in teaching and other things. And we'll definitely write it up so people will be drawn to it. Thank you so much for your time. <clears throat> wonderful, Janelle, to have you involved in this conversation. And David, wonderful to have you uh, involved in this as well. And um, <clears throat> thanks, Ethan and Bronwyn, your insights. Great to, to see you all together. And thanks a lot.